Uh, welcome everyone. We're just going to wait a minute or so longer for a few more people to arrive and then we'll be kicking off. Brilliant. Well, we'll make a start, I think. Um, hello and welcome to this Theos Lunchtime webinar. Uh, my name's Hannah Rich. I'm a senior researcher here at Theos uh, and I'll be hosting today's conversation. For those of you who are uh, not familiar with Theos, a particular welcome to you. We are uh, a religion and society think tank. We believe that faith um, and Christianity in particular can be a force for good in society. So we host conversations, debates, lectures on religion, politics, uh, and all aspects of society in the contemporary world. Uh, and we also write research and provide kind of commentary and analysis on current affairs and popular culture, such as the conversation we're going to be having today. Um, I'm joined by Paul Bickley and Marcus Speller for today's conversation. Uh, Paul Bickley is a research fellow at Theos and author of the 2012 report, Give Us Our Ball Back, which he'll be talking to us about a little bit later. Uh, Marcus will be known to many of you as the producer and anchor of the popular Football Ramble podcast, uh, as well as writer and co-host of the Blizzard podcast and various other brilliant football journalism things. Uh, today we'll be discussing the culture around football, uh, having a talk about what's happening in the modern game and what football could uh, or indeed should look like. Uh, Paul's going to talk to us for about 10 minutes, as I said, about his report. He and Marcus will then have an informal discussion about that and then we'll come to questions. I'll start, I've got some questions lined up already, but uh, if you'd like to send some through, we will try and discuss those. If you have questions, um, please don't use the chat facility, but put them in the, the Q&A function on Zoom um, and we'll get to them then. Uh, one other note, we are live streaming this on different platforms, both on Zoom and on YouTube, uh, but we'll only be taking questions via Zoom. So if you're watching on YouTube, then you would need to head over to Zoom to ask your questions. We're not recording on Zoom, um, but the streaming on YouTube is being recorded and will be available afterwards. With all of that out of the way, um, I'm going to hand over to Paul now to talk about Give Us Our Ball Back, a report he wrote for Theos back in 2012, along with Sam Tomlin, who I think is here today, um, and which I think is a definite contender for the best title of anything we've uh, ever published at Theos. Uh, so with no further ado, over to you, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you for this opportunity to stroll down memory lane. Um, uh, uh, it, and uh, thank you, Sam, if he's, if he's listening. It was really enjoyable working with him on that. And of course, it was a partnership project as well with um, uh, the guys at Sports Think Tank. Uh, and they're a think tank focusing on the questions around sport. So a really interesting um, uh, combination there, even to start. Um, I suppose I think back to when we were starting work on that report, probably about 10 years ago today. Um, and uh, witnessing the way in which sport had become a really serious form of politics. Uh, not quite in the way that we would mean that if we said it today, uh, but uh, in the way that if you think back to those kind of halcyon uh, kind of new labour days of uh, uh, cool Britannia, then sport had very much become part of an attempt to rebuild a, a kind of progressive British identity. And sport was a huge part of that. And of course that reached, um, uh, that was reaching peak um, in, uh, in about 10 years ago, we were in the run up to uh, the 2012 uh, Olympics uh, and that in itself had been a kind of really powerful narrative from winning the bids and then the attacks on that same day. And the, that, that there was a real kind of sense of building significance for not just the Olympics, but for the whole question of sport as a kind of tool for policy. 
it's worth remembering that the Olympics were uh, a, a probably about a, over 11 billion pounds investment and they had a lot riding on them because people had started to kind of ply in all these policy objectives. The inspire a generation uh, thing was was the, was the big thing there, which weren't tremendously well thought through in retrospect. But um, it's just another way in which, and we'll speak a little bit more about this, but it's a way in which um, the sport had become charged with a new significance. Um, but if you think back, and I was thinking back in preparation to this, to the uh, uh, wonderful, magical, brilliant uh, opening ceremony to the 2012 Olympics. And at the end of that um, uh, ceremony, uh, there was uh, the whole, uh, I'm very interested by the musicology there. And uh, at the end, there was this song being written by Underworld. Um, and um, But let me read you the second verse, because this makes an important point. Um, uh, if you'll forgive me, kind of <laughs> doing poetry. Uh, uh, and the light drive out our fears, and the joy drive out our pain. Uh, and the nations come to greet us, waving open arms like waves of golden corn. Ever hear us, O spirit of the world, may your light be ever near us. Always lead us from the dark. Though we may fall, we will fly and with love ever call. And um, it's a psalm uh, of some kind. It's a hymn. It's, um, it's, it's, this is kind of transcendent uh, language and it's brilliant. It's really powerful stuff, really heady stuff. And um, on one level, quite a long way from three lines on a shirt. Uh, but yet there's a similar power underpinning it. Uh, and I think one of the reasons we embarked on this whole project is because there's a, a real sense in which sports becomes, it is already charged before anybody tries to do anything with it, with a kind of transcendence. Uh, so uh, there's a famous religious sociologist called Peter Berger, and he wrote a book called A Rumor of Angels, and he identifies play and by extension sport and music as well as one of the ways in which in a non-religious world, people continue to seek for some expression, some outlet for a sense of uh, transcendence. Uh, and he argues it's, it's like when, you, when, you are when you're either playing or watching sports, you're kind of stepping outside of real time and real life. You're entering into a, a kind of transcendent space. And even when you're watching other people doing that, you feel, you feel, you feel a kind of release into deathless, um, joyful kind of transcendence. Um, now that might be laying on it on a, a, a bit thick, but let's, let's assume that some of that is given. Um, and then let's turn to the report, which was really an argument about all the ways in which the real world um, tries to kind of push back in and colonize that transcendent space. And we talked about uh, four different things. It was basically sport as morality, the sport as um, reconciliation, sport and the kind of sport as economy and uh sport as uh kind of public health uh because these were four areas in which there was clearly a rhetoric around sports can do this thing for us but that takes the intrinsic the joy of sport and begins to trade play in with extrinsic goods so um and i just want to say here this is not this is not a religious non-religious thing of course um there's a long tradition of uh, particularly Christians, but also other religions, kind of trying to use sport for their own purposes. Um, uh, so there's the muscular Christianity movement, that's kind of Victorian thing where sport becomes a way of teaching people teamwork and morality um, and was a very powerful thing, stands behind things like the YMCA. Some people also argue it stands behind something like the British Empire. Um, and even now there's loads and loads of sports ministries which seek to use sport as kind of way to connect with people, which is not wrong in any way. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's a risk that you begin to kind of damage something of the intrinsic joy of sport by trying to kind of get something off it. Um, uh, but uh, I won't talk about the sport of rec re reconciliation thing, but, um, just because the limitations of time. But we were very interested in this idea of the kind of public health benefit around the Olympics. And of course, the rhetoric again was about inspiring a generation, engaging people, in physical activity that would offer a huge kind of payoff in that way. Uh, the problem is it just generally doesn't work. Um, but, and it's partly about the kind of fuzzy policy goal. So like, what is it to inspire people and how do you evidence that? So there's lots of complexity around how you, 
how you do something as a politician or whether it's holding a sports mega event. Um, uh, well, I, that that was it there. And, and the, in a way, um, the rhetoric had grown before the policy could develop. So the, way, the, the government had this kind of huge job to kind of prove or do something to inspire generation when there's not really that much evidence that mega events really do that. Now, of course, they can inspire individuals and do inspire individuals and are a great way of kind of giving everybody an excuse to focus more on sport. But the use of it as a kind of policy method is probably a bit questionable. So um, I was kind of refreshing some of my kind of reading on this. And I came across paper, you know, read like this, the, the political answer promoted by official agencies claim outcomes that cannot be genuinely attributed uh, to the Olympic programme. So there was, uh, there was um, a big effort afterwards to kind of prove that this had inspired the generation. And there were, but do you know, the, the evidence is actually quite complicated. Some sports experience greater participation, others dipped afterwards and can need to continue to kind of dip and waver around. And people, people just simply making the point, look, it's much more complicated than that. There are all sorts of pushes and pulls for people uh, on the question of physical activity. Anyway, that's that. Um, then uh, also interesting to think about this economic question. Um, and we spent quite a lot of time reflecting on that rhetoric of, of sport as big business, which is, of course, on a level true on lots of ways. Um, but it's a claim to for sports legitimacy and its salience. And again, for administrators who want you know, who want policymakers to think this is this is more than just people kicking stuff around in, on a park. It's it's kind of significant on a social and political level. Um, the problem I think we felt was that it leads to distorted decision decision making all the time on the part of uh, administrators. Um, there is. Um, if I can put it like this, um, I think what is developing, particularly in the world of football, but not exclusively so, is a kind of principal agent problem where uh, people who feel they have a massive stake in the future of the game or in the future of their club or um, the league in which they play and things like that, the, the European Super League is the most obvious example of this. But uh, people have a real frustration around the level of agency that they have. And, the, you know, so they feel a huge sense of identity with their club or with their nation. Um, but uh, something something is happening that's kind of out with their control. Hence what happened with the European Super League, huge protests kind of and a buildup of resent. Now, that's not new. I don't think it's happened within the last six months. I think that's years and years old. Um, uh, and uh, it's not, of course, a principal agent problem in the sense like some clubs are floated on the stock market. So they're owned by um, they're owned by whoever owns shares. Um, it's more that sense of that kind of deep sense of identity. And this is part of my life and my identity. Um, don't muck about with it. Don't do that. Um, yet people have no platform, no mechanism, because actually lots of the um, who we think are the custodians of the sport, the administrators, um, might just be the owners. And I think there's a difference between ownership and custodianship, if I could put it like that. There's an there's a difference between the uh, financial pecuniary interest in running a football club and the interest in kind of guarding the tradition of a club or of a sport or of a particular league. So I think there's something to be done and said there. And uh, if there's a way, we, I mean, how to resolve that problem, you have to, I think you have to begin to look at ways to align legal and financial ownership with that sense of, uh, with that sense of identity. Uh, I notice uh, the Celtic uh, Supporters Trust were trying to get the club to refund season ticket holders in the form of a share offer. I think that, I actually think that's a kind of super idea, and of course it got it got kicked a long way off. But um, things like that are, are, I think, increasingly going to be important. How do we align that kind of technical ownership with the sense of identity that people have um, with a club? Um, it, uh, just in closing. Uh, we can't carry on without uh, acknowledging some of the kind of tension that's been around the uh, England football team and that question of uh, taking the knee uh, and what that means. Uh, but I think what we see there is a, is a similar thing happening, is um, a, a similar thing of, well, firstly, the sport has become about something else and we can't, we can't as it were, resile from that. It has become about something else. 
Um, and it, as much as I might want to kind of philosophically regret that, the, t- the tension now is how you ensure that people who have a deep sense of identity with the game uh, don't feel like they're being uh, kind of bullied through it. So I think it's really complicated. And I think the England team and management are providing a lot of leadership but it is not, it's not a simple thing. And I think, but the root cause of the anxiety around that, I would want to argue ultimately, is not just the issue, which is of course, hugely controversial and difficult. Um, uh, it's also about the temptation to use sport as a way of achieving other goals and other goods, other extrinsic goods. So yeah, give us our ball back. I think it's that kind of sense of, you're doing something with this that we don't, uh, we're not happy with. Um, I, and uh, obviously that's becoming, it, if anything, uh, the problem has become more intense uh, over the last uh, 10 years, not less. And um, I really think we, particularly in the world of football, need to look about, look again at, at kind of different forms of ownership and agency and voice for supporters. Thanks so much, Paul. There's there's a huge amount to unpack there. Um, and I was really struck in, in reading the report again uh, this week, how much of it is much more relevant now than it, or even more relevant than when you you wrote it. You talk about how we've kind of unwittingly, and this is a quote, unwittingly downgraded sport to a merely utilitarian tool um, and tried to kind of expect too much of sport and in particular football that it just it just can't deliver in a, not just in a sporting sense, but in a, in a political sense and an economic sense. Um, Marcus, I'm going to come to you now to kind of respond to that. I'm sure there's, there's plenty of things you might want to say um, in response to some of what Paul's kind of talked us through there. But um, yeah, I'll let you let you start there. Uh, yeah, where, where, where to begin? I mean, yeah, a lot of really interesting points, Paul, that, that I obviously agree with. I mean, I think, yeah, the, the, I mean, the title of, you know, Give Us Our Ball Back kind of gets to the heart of it. I know um, journalist and, and, and football writer, you know, Mike Calvin has done some documentaries and uh, along these, these kind of things. And I think one of the one doesn't want to be too negative about this because you can really tear your hair out and go, what are the solutions here? Uh, what, what, what can we do to, uh, as you say, get our ball back? And it is very, very difficult um, not to try and suggest some sort of socialist revolution. But I'd be willing to sort of ask you, Paul, that, that how do you think um, football can go about this and, and and really to start with the economic thing tackle the the kind of billionaires and, and those who own the football clubs I mean the, the Bundesliga model the 50 plus one rule is, is quite a, a popular suggestion you mentioned the Celtic fans there uh, with with a with a suggestion as, as, when I look at it, I sort of think you're asking billionaires and and incredibly rich and powerful people to kind of give up a bit of what they have and be and be nice and be kind. And there tends not to be too much of a precedent with that in history. Mm. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I, so uh, it's not, and it's not simple. Uh, like ostensibly though, there are, there are opportunities. I, th- I think that it requires, um, I mean, it requires I think part of it, part of it would require fans not to wait for other people to fix this uh, for them. So if, uh, but this only work, uh, this uh, this suggestion would only really work for um, uh, clubs stock, uh, floated on the stock exchange. But um, that, so that's a, that's a publicly owned club. You have to, you have to chase you have to chase those shares, um, and uh, you know just just work work on a long term buyout. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing. And you get to a point where you're going to hit a ceiling because most of those clubs are um, owned 51% or more by, by the primary owner um, and they're, they're in control of things. But you, get a, you can get a voice at the table. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think what is interesting and quite tense about this moment is, of course, there's, there's lots of uh, sense, uh, sentiment that, um, you know, um, uh, the, kind of, the, the, the kind of populist political forces want to jump on this bandwagon um, and and it will be a popular move because because I do think there's this kind of underlying simmering resent. Um, uh, so you have to be careful, I think, with the legal, uh, with the legal and political uh, kind of route. Um, but I also think people need to kind of row back from the kind of idolizing of the, just let make sure other things grow up alongside. So mm-hmm. just all of these clubs, you know, um, Manchester United floated on the New York Stock stock exchange 
you know, started a hundred and odd years ago by a group of people. In, you know, I can't. Remember, it wasn't. It wasn't. It didn't even have Manchester in the title, did it? But I can't remember <laughs> the, the history of it. But they, you know, don't lose. Don't lose the the joy of the actual game. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the can continue to kind of protest that and hold that is just to start up new clubs, and that of course has been done re- uh, in recent history. Um, uh, not least in Manchester. So um, there is something about guard the game. P- uh, like people who are genuine custodians of the game, which are generally speaking are not the people that own it and people that are fans of it. Uh, they need to continue to play and start clubs and uh, attend matches and do all of that. And every time they do that, they they are kind of serving the intrinsic good of the game, um, which is not hugely satisfactory, I know, because it doesn't solve the big questions. Uh, but interesting that um, uh, those clubs this year, they just didn't get away with it. They, they overextended themselves. Uh, they went too far. And uh, now you wonder what the implications of that, of course, is the fan-led review that the, that the government have started. Um, I do wonder if it's reached its peak and that will now, we'll now almost naturally kind of pull back into something a little bit different. Also, there's the issue now of uh, financial viability of... Uh, clubs in the pandemic and after the pandemic. We just don't know how this is going to play out. So it could be that some of these kind of clubs that think they can basically ignore the local fan base uh, have to rethink that. Um, uh, We just don't know what the next few years holds, but it could be uh, that uh, uh, they have to to kind of remember how important um, their local fans are for supporting the club. Uh, because uh, you know, because international competition is going to continue to be difficult for a while. We know, we we know all that, but yeah, that's not that's a bit of a waffle to a very good. No, no, I, I understand what you say. I mean, take Everton for example. You know, they they've got the is it the big blue family? They they call it. You know, they've really stepped up in their local community since since COVID hit. You know, they've done they've done an awful lot with helping reaching out to the the, the vulnerable and, uh, and and so on those in need. And they and they've done pretty well. I mean, they've even done things. Um, they've got some of their players to read bedtime stories for, for children, you know, yeah. so it's really so. They, they, they've, they've done a lot. And I think that that's, that is an interesting thing because one can immediately think, well, what about the fan base in the Far East? What about the fan no. base? It's kind of like, <laughs> what about the ones, and especially at this time where we can't travel, what about the ones who are on your doorstep, actually, the ones who have, have been around for, for, for generations? I do, I do find that quite interesting. But going back to y- your earlier point about setting up clubs and, and going in more grassroots, I went to um, a club that have had quite a bit of uh, a, a little bit of press with regards to it being a bit more grassroots and a little bit more community focused. A club in in South London, Dulwich Hamlet, um, the Hipsters' Choice, as, uh, oh. you, as as some people have have, have suggested. And I, I went there. Uh, it would have well, it could well, it must have been more than a year and a half ago. Pretty say two and about two and a half years ago, and went round and spoke to a lot of the crowd during a match. And for those who don't know Dulwich Hamlet, it's um, they're a lower league side, uh, non-league side. Uh, you can have a pint by the pitch. Um, uh, the, the fans go and stand behind the goal that Dulwich Hamlet are are, um, are shooting into, and then in the second half they can go up the other end and 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 stand behind the goal that Dulwich are shooting in that end. So it's quite a novel thing, and as I say, it feels quite um, it, it feels quite sort of a, a, a bit more of a, an indie kind of crowd, if you will, and. I went around and I and I asked, um, I don't know, say 20, 25, I was doing a little piece, uh, a, a good sort of chunk of the supporters. And, and I, and I the, the, the questions I would often ask them is, okay, take five, 10 years time. Would you want Dulwich Hamlet to be competing in say League One, dare I even say the championship? And you won't be able to have a pint by the side of the pitch perhaps, or you no. won't be able to go up the other end of the goal. All the stuff that you like about this grassroots club, you won't be able to do that. Would you take that, or would you actually go? Do you know what? I actually quite like. I I, I quite like to keep it here. Every mm. one of them to a person said, "I want the success," mm. and that's the thing with sport. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a competition, and you want to win, and you don't want to kind of put a cap on it. If you see what I mean, I talked to um, Ivor Heller, the AFC Wimbledon uh, uh, guy. I mean, that's incredible what they've done at AFC Wimbledon. Yeah, uh, it really is incredible, and he. I asked him this and I said, why is that? And he just simply said, because nobody within their right mind 
puts a cap on success. And I thought, yes, of course. Like it, it, it's, it was such an interesting thing. And that is, I think that is the great battle, uh, Paul, is that in football, you want to win. You want the cameras turning up. You want the Champions League. You want all this. But unfortunately, <laughs> if you do that, those who hold the keys to the kingdom are the people who are in extreme it can be extremely questionable to put it diplomatically yeah but and there's there's the the world for clubs like um afc wimbledon though if they if they as they kind of hopefully meet ongoing success mm. well there will come there will come decision points where they mm. have to make a choice between um uh certain forms of club structure so, so it becomes it becomes very very mm-hmm. Um, detailed kind of administrative stuff mm-hmm. and um, I was reading um, an article uh, actually which Hannah sent to me about um, uh, test match cricket and one of the problems with test match cricket is be- that there are basically three teams that want to play each other a lot mm-hmm. um, and but that's boring uh, although, <laughs> although uh, you know I mean and, and, and Ashes is a, is, a, is, a, is a magical moment apart from there are about five every Weak these days, you know, <laughs> they just seem to be coming along quite frequently. So um, there are things there, are, there, are, there are actually kind of quite detailed decisions within, um, I think, across a sport. Um, but uh, for a club like FC Wimbledon, they will have to they will have to continue to to kind of guard and be custodian of the of the values of a kind of grassroots club. Mm-hmm. If success means not just success on the pitch, but success in the boardroom. Or well, as one of the big issues, of course, in football, which we haven't mentioned, and we could probably uh, open a, a big, a big can of worms on, is the, is the issue of like um, uh, player wages and, uh, and 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 those kind of things, which is what, which is clearly one of the things that pulls bad money into the game. You know, you can't, you need a lot of money to compete at that top level. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's what that's something that, that that's a big structural issue, and it doesn't have an easy answer. Um, uh, how do you, how do you resolve that? I don't I don't I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think I think for a club that is growing in its success, it, there will become little decision points about well, um, how how are you going to go? How are you going to go go now? Um, I, th- I think actually the truth is that they can, they can, you can be very grassrootsy quite a long way up. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, even even you know, and even some most teams in the Premiership are not what we kind of in our worst and darkest moments think that we see in the Premier. There's lots of kind of community and kind of mm-hmm. focus and uh, like clubs value that clearly, or most clubs value that. Um, it's just when they're thinking of themselves as a business, they're not always running themselves like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, sure. Yeah, I mean, having been to Burnley's training ground, it, it it's a far cry from Manchester City's training ground. Both are Premier League clubs, so I I, I take your point there. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, going back to what you were saying about about players' wages and so on. I mean, David Goldblatt, the football writer, he he sort of argued that financial fair play (FFP), which came in. Um, not that long ago was was obviously it was brought in to, to be designed to to have clubs spend within their means so you couldn't have the the billionaire come in and just lavishly sort of uh, uh, splash the cash in, in a ridiculous way that we saw at the turn of the century uh, so try and make it a bit of a, a fairer and more competitive playing field but David Goblet argued that the, the problem is you needed to bring that in in the 90s and it came in too late and now the glass ceiling has been sort of established if you if you see what I mean I, I mean would, would you go because it is hard for for a club because years ago we could say someone like AFC Wimbledon they could get say a huge injection from um uh, uh, you, you know someone who happened to be an AFC Wimbledon fan and has made a lot of money and you could really sort of go at it and and financially kind of cook it a bit more you get up there you get your foot in the door and then you try and play it kind of quite well that's not really an option anymore and I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing but do you think though that it's the FFPs it, it's made it even harder perhaps for teams to to kind of come through I think probably you know more about that than me uh, so I'm, okay. I'm, I'm loath I'm to dissent um, like that um, yeah, I mean, I, I like David Goldblatt's point about that. You know, it was it was too it was too late. The the, the mm-hmm. kind of hole already bolted. Yeah, 
I think um, that's the point. Oh, sorry to, to make, not necessarily specifically on FFP, but this this idea that the the dark forces have been re- released in football, and to try and bring yeah. them back is 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 very very difficult. I mean, you, you, you people talk about Leicester City, and when they won the FA Cup, everyone was saying, "Oh, isn't it great?" And they're hugging the owner and and, and so on. I mean, where the money came from Leicester City again has been a point of discussion shall we say we'll leave that there but it seems to be a case of we want uh, a, a, bene- a benevolent billionaire is okay it's the, the, the ones that are sort of questionable if you see what yeah I mean. you've got to find your right kind of billionaire <laughs> exactly exactly uh, Arsenal <laughs> trying to get I mean, Daniel Ek of, of uh, Spotify notoriety uh, he seems to think well I'll come in with my billions but I'm a nice billionaire and I'll try and kind of shake it up do you, do you think that's maybe the way it's got to be? It's got to be, as I say, benign or benevolent billionaires trying to sort of muscle their way in and then kind of saying, right, you know, free well, shares I, for everybody. If, if if it were a club that I loved, I wouldn't mm. see that happen. That's all, uh, that's, that's all I can say. Of course, like from a from a purely from a purely kind of success oriented... But of course, we also know mm. uh, that just um, uh, throwing cash at the... Um, uh, uh, squads mm-hmm. isn't actually any uh, isn't a guaranteed route to success, mm-hmm. but you need some, uh, and in fact, arguably quite a lot. Would I want to see that as a way that I, a club that I loved, uh, and that more important, I was part of? So, is this thing of what's what's the agency there for the, for the fan? Is it is it just a, is it just kind of are they, are they? I mean, fans the wrong word, isn't it? And mm-hmm. need a better word for it because I think. Um, uh, there's a, that sense of having a stake. Um, so I, it, particularly for me, if, I, if, if it was a club that I strongly identified with and wanted to see grow and prosper, um, would I be, you know, would I be tempted if a, a, if a kind of, a, if, a, if, a, if a deep-pocketed um, kind of gentleman came along and offered me it? <laughs> of course, but the wider good of the club, the wider good of the everything which it does, um, and almost as this kind of like, unintentional overflow benefits all all the so again there's something just about what is happening on the pitch that's the that's that's a really important whenever we're thinking about sport we have to mm-hmm. think about ex- intrinsic value, value but i do think if you if you do things to destroy that you can de- destroy things which kind of naturally overflow from it as well mm-hmm. um i mean you just like as soon as you do that you are basically selling your soul aren't you? and that's <laughs> That, that would be my point. You you give somebody control, you yield it up. Yeah. Uh, but of course, it's always it's always context dependent. Like there's going to be lots of clubs where it's you know it's a matter of um, you know kind of do or die. I'm not. I don't want to be harsh on people that that make decisions like that. Mm-hmm. If it was a club that I loved and was part of and had a deep sense of a stake in it, I wouldn't want to see it achieve success just because somebody with a big checkbook came along. Mm. But that's a personal perspective. Uh, I don't, uh, but but uh, I think there are structural issues here as well. I just think, like, uh, actually, the good of the game isn't usually defended by the Premiership or by um, a good season in the Premiership. Um, it's often by what people are doing uh, on an ordinary level in community sports club um, and uh, on a Saturday or Sunday morning and what they do with the children and those kind of things. That's what that's what's feeding the game. We think that it's the Premiership, but it's not. Yeah. Um, but that's a kind of that's a kind of bit of a sermonette. I'm not sure that, whether that's kind of <laughs> a policy point of view. Yeah, I think I think I think what I like about watching the European Championships at the moment is, I mean, obviously there's money a wash in that. You know, there's <laughs> there's games in Baku for crying out loud. You know, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. these things don't these things happen for a reason. You know, but what I what I love about the European Championships is that is that it it it's you've made up of, of the teams are made up of their of their fellow countrymen and so yeah. at least ostensibly i may be very naive in saying that but at least there is a sort of well certainly from my point of view there's a slight sort of purity there i see if you see what i mean and we i mean last night we saw wales beating turkey the scenes of celebration and so on. that's what we love about the game and i liked yeah. your report when you talked about this idea of play and this idea of fun and the actual what are we turning up for to, yeah. to, to do this and when you see players you know um like Ronaldinho for Brazil would be a great example when he's playing in these huge matches but there's a little smile there's a little trick or a little flick that's exactly why we turn up yeah. to see this 
so this is this actually clarifies what I was just trying to say. So mm-hmm. this point of like, what kind of success do you want? Yeah. And there was this problem with the, the with the England team, um, really. I suppose in 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 the in the first decade of this century, mm-hmm. there was this sense of these guys just aren't really there. They're not really interested in playing for England. They're interested in um, making a lot of money playing for whichever club they're part of. And I don't think that was often articulated, but there were, you know it was mm-hmm. definitely there in, in in some of the commentary. I'm not sure it was fair either. I I I I. I can't make windows into players' souls and know what's motivating them. Sure. I do think uh, there is a risk at a certain point if you, if you if you allow your game to be built on like this is big business, the Premiership is big business, business our, our sport is big business. If that's the fundamental logic, then don't be surprised mm. if you don't get like other kinds of success. And I think when you play for a national team, it's got it's got to work differently. It's a different. There's a different sentiment about it there's mm. you've got to kind of gather a squad for a short period of time you know there's all those questions around what is holding these people together are they committed to each other and uh, you know what what is in their mind which is massively what the letter was about last week right you know kind of when these guys walk onto the pitch Gareth Southgate was saying they're you know they're there for the right reasons um and uh, that was really interesting but uh, if you if you if you build a game which is calculated and premised on one kind of success. Don't be surprised if you never see the other kind of success. Um, you know, and lots of people have argued this is why Germany win national tournaments. Yeah. England don't, because yeah. it's two different maths almost. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there is a book called "Why England Lose." Nobody would dare write "Why Germany Lose" because it wouldn't be relevant, you know. <laughs> I'm really loath to kind of interrupt what's been a, a great conversation back and forth between you. And um, I'll let you get back on it in a minute. But um, just a reminder that if anyone's got any questions, if you could put them in the question and answer function of the Zoom rather than in the chat, um, it's a little bit easier to see them if they're there. Um, but back to why England and or uh, Germany do and don't lose. Paul, what do you think of that? Well, um, I don't, uh, well, obviously... Like this, there is this thing which happens, which sometimes people get on a field and they play a game and like there's some serendipity uh, and uh, the ball goes in the net. And like so much of what happens on a pitch is utterly random and has no relationship to anything about the structure of the game or ownership of clubs or anything like that. So, you know, how do I know? But it just, it just seems, it just seems unavoidable ultimately, isn't it? With, with, Teams that go ostensibly full of so much talent, mm-hmm. uh, but almost but consistently come back empty-handed. Um, is, is is there something? Is there something about the game, uh, the way that the game is managed, the way that the kind of uh, players board? You know what's going on under the bonnet. We don't always know, mm-hmm. uh, but it will. That that question will only get harder to answer <laughs> yeah. as things roll through. We kind of wait. And we can't, but there's a sense, there's a real sense of the nation waiting for, for, for a victory just to kind of plop off the end of a, mm. a kind of veil belt, you know, law of averages, we must get one soon. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure about that. Um, uh, you know, uh, there are other questions as well again, about, you know, how much, um, how, how good we are at kind of nurturing uh, our national talent. I'm not sure that's as kind of prevalent as it used to be. I don't hear so many people saying uh, saying that about our clubs now as that as they were maybe ten years ago. Uh, but it feels like that's the kind of question that you've got to ask. How do you explain consistent lack of success? Mm-hmm. Um, and we're not only talking about you know you got to you got to semi-finals and met a, an astonishing team and lost. It's you know occasionally tournaments that we don't even qualify for. Mm-hmm. So you have to, I, I just think you have to ask that question. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about um, whether the kind of the ship sailed and football's gone, you know, so far that we can't get it back. Um, but we've got a question about whether the fact that we're um, still paying for this, so we are largely still paying our uh, Sky subscriptions and our TV subscriptions. Do we need to um, sacrifice watching it if we want to change the game? You know, is this going to not um, not change until we all stop paying our subscriptions, and that's going to be what kind of sends the message that that we need to. To see some change, Marcus. What do you think about that? And, and would you be willing to to stop paying your subscriptions if that's what it took? Um, I think, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of some football fans 
have been annoyed at sort of Sky Sports and probably now BT Sport over the years. Um, and it, it is a tricky one. I think that the more money that comes into the game, you, you know, there's an argument there that it's, it's, you know, it's made things better and, and there's more quality. You know, the, the Premier League can attract bigger players because of TV rights and, and so on and so forth. I don't want to sort of go down the be careful what you wish for kind of kind of route, but I think there's probably other ways. I think I think TV broadcasters, most countries, in fact, you could even say every single other country in the world would love the kind of TV broadcasting. Uh, 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 what would it be? The, 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 the media, the spotlight on their leagues like the Premier League does. And in terms of purely business um, kind of uh, a chat, the Premier League has done incredibly well. Whether that's to the satisfaction of fans or not, as we're talking about, it's a different question. And and so I don't know if the right idea is to sort of, you know, stick it to the broadcasters because you 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 want a bit of clamber, you want a bit of attention on your on your leagues. You know, I don't want to be. You know, we just mentioned the European Championships; they're obviously a different beast. It's on terrestrial TV, but I don't want to be flicking through some sort of little silly digital channels on a free view trying to find the game. I think no, no, this is a big prime time event. People want to watch it, therefore it's going to take a bit of place. I think to try and, and get to the the real sort of rooted, deep-rooted problems in football, I, I'm reluctant to think it's the TV broadcasters. I think that might be a case, if you go after the broadcasters, it might be a case of the sort of the, the tail wagging the dog, if you see what I mean. So I, I think maybe it's, it lies elsewhere. Yeah, we've got a question as well about what you, um, what you make of Gary Neville's campaign and, and the wider campaign for an independent regulator in football. Do you think that's something we, we need or...? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I, I don't know whether it will have much effect, but you don't know until you try. And I think Neville is obviously passionate about this. You know, he's got his own um, football team, Salford City, with his mates, you know, and, and how they're operating. So he's seeing what it's like running a football club firsthand. He's obviously a very eloquent and, and, uh, and a good speaker on such things. So, yes, I'd, lo- I'd like to see it happen. As I say, will it have much of an effect? Hopefully. Um, bringing people in different voices and, and, and so on and so forth. It may well be a, a case of trial and error with this kind of stuff to sort of scratch away and see what happens. I mean, Paul mentioned the European Super League. You know, that was great. Actually, a lot of people turned around and went, no, we're not having it. So we can, I can sit here and say, oh, well, if fans actually all shout as one, will that make a difference? Well, it did there. And actually, w- with the big football clubs, you know, that was always their kind of their ace card, if, or, or, which, or they thought it was their ace card. Big clubs used to say used to kind of threaten UEFA and, and other organising bodies and say, well, we'll do a Super League if you don't bow to our uh, demands, which is why we see the Champions League in this kind of, it'll soon have this new ludicrous format in, 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 a, in a year or two or whenever it's happening, I forget, might be 2024. Uh, and so they said, all right, they played their race card and it, and it blew up in their faces because a lot of fans all together banded together and said, nah, we're not having that. And they took on the likes of Manchester United and Chelsea and so on. And the English clubs quickly redacted their statements or, 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 or pulled back on that. So that actually sets a quite a good precedent. So I am intrigued to see what, what Neville will do. He's obviously a guy who people listen to. Certainly football fans listen to. He's probably the top pundit at the moment in this country. So, yeah, I, I am intrigued. And I would like to think it would, it would make some sort of an impact. Right, Paul, I'm going to come to you um, with this next question, which is from Jack, uh, which is on what is the right balance between tech and kind of format innovation in sport and a respect for the foundations of the game? So things like VAR, uh, T20 and the 100, and I know you'll have opinions on those in cricket, Paul. Um, and how can we avoid like innovation like that uh, undermining our love of the sport? Quite a lot of it often feels kind of gimmicky, or at least uh, I often um, I feel that about well, I don't know. I wait to see about the hundred, which hasn't yet kind of seen a season yet. So, um, but I don't know whether shaving twelve balls off a off a off a twenty twenty game is. I'm sure there are other things, and I'll go and watch some of it and kind of, you know, kind of see how I feel. Um, I think this is this is a, like a. Uh, it's a great question, by the way, um, and um, from the kind of kind of on pitch technology point of view. Uh, I think I, I, what I think is that people basically need to be flexible and some things that you try just don't work. So be willing to kind of give something a go and then, and then let it go. I th- it's interesting how in some sports, the, the people have responded very differently. 
tennis, cricket, football, the sentiment around it just seems to be completely different. I mean, broadly accepted in cricket and tennis and even quite enjoyed, you know, if there's an LBW decision and there's a bit more tension around it. Um, but uh, in football, I think seems to have kind of landed much more controversially. Um, uh, uh, and I don't, uh, I think that's just, that's just partly to do with about the kind of pitch side culture, which by the way, is a really interesting kind of, there are whole studies around kind of moral behavior and uh, on the pitch and how that's influenced by what's happening at the side of the pitch. You know, so it's it, it quite the, the influence of the fans on the pitch itself is quite interesting, I think. But the, I'm talking here about the influence of the fans or the view of the fans about VAR. Um, I don't know. I don't, from my point of view, don't 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 think it needed to be as controversial as it's been. Um, and uh, I, that's quite a good thing. The format innovation, which seems to be just like I think cricket is a bit, in a bit of a state over that. I mean, 2020 has worked. Uh, I don't think uh, if I were to look into the future, I don't think the hundred is going to particularly kind of change things uh, uh, dramatically. Um, so you need to decide what is a good form of the game and different forms of the game. And of course, cricket again is in an unusual position. You've got a five day game, you've got a four day game at a domestic level, you've got one dayers and 40 over one dayers and 50 over one dayers. And there's just, there's just a lot of kind of format confusion. So it seems to me the best thing to do might be to thin that down just stick, keep things simple. Um, complexity is, I feel like, a bit of an em- enemy. Uh, but obviously, you know, that's that's a particular kind of cricketing issue. Um, but I quite, I quite like, I quite like the technological innovations. I don't know why it's been so controversial on football. We are, um, we're coming towards the end of our our time for this conversation together. So, um, just with one final question, which I'll ask to both of you, um, which is whether. Repeated England disappointment has a positive role in national unity. Uh, would we as a country be comfortable <laughs> with, or indeed would we actually know what to do with ourselves if we actually got some success? Um, or is it so tied up in the fact that we always lose that actually we secretly quite enjoy that? Uh, Marcus, what do you think? <laughs> I'd like to give it a go. I really would like to see uh, what, what, what that would do. I, I No, I think it's time England had some success uh, in, in football. Um, I mean, the Euros, it's going to be a tall order. I know England have got a good side, but anyway, let's not bog down with the details of that too much. But no, I, I think England is a country that has 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 changed quite a bit or or is changing. And and actually, I think there's nothing quite like a success on in, in a big sporting arena that kind of just helps with, with that kind of thing. Um, I think that there are some nations... I was talking to a Welsh friend of mine the other day, and he said, there's nothing like Wales... They want to do well, but then get mugged off. If you see what I mean, so you want to, you want to do really, really well, but then, but, but you you quite like complaining about how they should have won, but oh, it was a uh, that that kind of thing. But Wales are a very different nation, much smaller nation, of course. I think England now. You look at the the successes that say France have had. England is perhaps at least in terms of population and population um, demographic would be more similar to a country like France. And hearing what French people said. Um, celebrating, you know, World Cup wins and, and and all this kind of stuff. I think England, again, to use that word again, at least ostensibly uh, may help. And I just, I, I think anything to get England at the moment feel good and anything that could potentially unite because it does feel a bit divided because of, I don't want to say Brexit, but you know, things like that. Whereas you say, you look at a, Scot- a country like Scotland, which, you know, they seem at least uh, a little bit more united when it comes to sort of sporting events and, and so on and so forth. So, yes, ultimately, what I'm trying to say is I would really like England to win and I think it would have a positive effect. Well, I'll let you have the, the final word on that one. Would you like England to win or are you, you secretly hoping that we can uh, wallow in our <laughs> sorrows for a little bit longer? Well, it's just it's just worth saying, like, if you think um, England is divided, then France uh, and also the, the football politics of France mm. is at the minute extremely divided. I suppose so. Yeah. Um, so it's like I think the uh, I'm, I don't I don't know. I would love England to win. It, it has to kind of get to uh, uh, like a semi final and not win in some kind of tragic penalty. <laughs> yeah, um, or, or you know, kind of lose lose. In a, 
losing a kind of clear room or and, and kind of kind of way. Um, and, uh, you know, it kind of, I think there were different, you know, of course I'd love to see them win. Um, uh, France looked very strong. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I, you know, but um, I would be shouting as loudly as anybody else. It would be great. And it would be, I think it would lift us all on what's been a difficult <laughs> kind of 18 months. Mm-hmm. Great, thanks. I will point out we've got a couple of uh, Scottish fans with us today, so whether that would lift us all is is, is one for, for them to decide, I guess, and we'll see how that goes tomorrow. Um, if you'll indulge me for a, for a second, I'm going to end with a quote from Bill Shankly, who said that um, at a football club there's a holy trinity, the players, the manager and the supporters. The directors don't come into it, they're only there to sign the cheques. Um, I think if anything today we have very firmly established that that's not the case, but maybe we would like to get back to that being uh, more the way things are in football. Well, thank you all for coming anyway, for for giving up your lunchtime to to listen to us talk about these things. Um, If you've enjoyed it, please do support Theos, uh, follow us on social media. And um, if you are, as I'm sure you are, eager to read the report that Paul's been sharing with us, you can download that from our website. uh, And all the details should be in the chat right about now. Uh, Thank you to Paul and thank you to to Marcus for sharing with us today. Um, And as I said, thank you all for coming. That's been, um, yeah, a really enjoyable conversation.